Pete, welcome everybody, and just make the observation that from this minute onwards, uh, the meeting is being recorded, and it will put, be put on our website um, at the conclusion for uh, public access. Just also want to acknowledge um, Janine, are you online, Janine Rankin? So Janine has been invited from the media. Uh, Janine, is, Janine is online, but it's on mute. Okay, fantastic. So Janine is, is here and welcome. Um, and I've asked if John could uh, 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 open our meeting with a karakia rather than us all participating, because I think it creates um, elements of technical confusion. So John, could you open with our karakia, please? Hi. Uh, kia ora, Brendan. Um, uh, tēnā koe, um, uh, e kai mahi mā, um, uh, kei tēnō e tātou. Uh, oh, but before I start the karakia, could you mute your microphones? But you can please follow, but if you mute, that means we don't get all that uh, uh, audio scrum. Oh, kia ora tātou. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa paunamu te moana, e huarahi mā tātou i te rangina. Haruaha atu, aroha mai. Tato i a tato i nga wākata uie taiki. Taiki e. Kia ora, John. Thank you. Um, just, Nikki, can you just give us one piece of advice when we're wanting to grab attention? Um, you mentioned something about a hand, but I'm not sure I understand how that works. Okay, in your control bar, there is a raise hand option. Um, just depending on your setup, it's normally down the right hand side underneath um, manage participants. Um, but if you can't find that option, I think possibly remain on mute. And if we raise the right hand, hand, then we can I, see. Nikki, I think you're the only one that will have that option because you've got the controller. I think Brendan is probably best just as you do on the teleconference, just to work through um, the board members by name, Brendan. Um, okay. Right. Seeing as you can't see everybody, um, okay. unless you want me to do it from here because I can see everybody and I can actually just say to you when I can see a hand up, the people physically raise their hand. Okay. There's also the chat option. Yeah, well, chat, I think let's just actually keep it vocal because we're recording it. I prefer us not to be using the chat option if we can avoid it. Um, so that we are going to put this recording when we get started, and this won't be on it. We're going to put the recording up on our website. It might take a day or so to do that, Brendan. But how about if I just, uh, if you if you would welcome it, I can just let you know when I can see, because I've got everybody in front of me. I can tell you when I can see it and. Okay. All right. Look, we're all, we're all pretty understanding, and clearly we're learning as we go. So um, the crucial part is to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to participate which is what we always do, and it won't be any different this time, but it just might, um, it, it might, it may frustrate somebody, I don't know, but we'll give it a go and see how we land, eh? Okay, so um, let's just get some acknowledgements of additional people that are on, uh, are in the room uh, that wouldn't uh, normally be there. So obviously we've talked to you, Bruno, and, and um, I'm just trying to find you, and welcome. And no doubt you'll have the opportunity to um, to participate when we get to to your item on the on the order paper. But, but welcome, Tony, um, as our independent. Great to have you on board today as well. Welcome. Um, and I don't think there's anybody else that wouldn't usually be in the room. So that covers us all off in terms of um, of attendees in the room. Yeah. Right. Um, so there are no apologies. Um, I'm not aware of any late items. Um, and our registrations of interest update, we clearly know where that is. And if there's anything to be declared, um, if we just make sure that's forwarded through to, uh, to Nikki, uh, not declared for recording, uh, to put that through to Nikki. Uh, we've got the minutes of the previous meeting and is somebody prepared to move them as a true and correct record? Yeah, I'm happy to do that, Brendan. Sure. Okay, so move, move, Karen. Second, Muriel. Is yep. there any discussion on the on matters arising from those minutes? No, we're all no. pretty good. Okay, if we're all 
all happy with that. I'll, I'll put it in favour, please say aye against its carry. Aye. So we're moving, moving to the CEO's aye. report. Um, so, Kath, welcome. Aye. Thank you, Brendan. Um, so uh, what I'll do is, as per our normal board meeting, I'll take the um, Chief Executive's report as read, and I'm happy to um, answer any questions or respond to any comments that any of the board members might have. Uh, well, there will be a few, um, and maybe, what's the, so, does anybody wish to make comment on the CEO's report? No hands, Brendan. No hands, okay. So, um, can we just get a bit more uh, input, Kath, on under the annual plan budget, uh, the bottom, the third paragraph on the bottom of page 15, the ministry guidelines for submission. So you've got a couple of dates that we're working to there, June or July. Um, but have you heard anything more in terms of an update around um, how tight those dates are? So um, the Ministry um, has just actually yesterday, in fact, um, sent an email saying that they expect to give us any um, guidance now uh, for how we might approach our annual plan um, in mid-May. So, um, so in mid-May we'll get updated annual planning guidance. Um, and we're not expecting that they will have to provide any further um, reports to them until <coughs> mid-June. Um, and at this time, we haven't had any feedback on the draft that was provided. So that's the draft that went in on the 4th of March? That's correct. Okay, so from the 4th of March to now, we have not received anything back. And I understand all of that. But in terms of our machinery, the entire inside our organisation, we're still continuing with that preparation. Uh, so the uh, actual annual plan in itself was a fairly tidy um, draft annual plan, in my view. Yep. Um, uh, Neil's team has, to a certain extent, been uh, ring fenced from the COVID response to enable his team to continue with priority programs of work, including some that are on the agenda today, like the Holidays Act compliance program, the preparation of our budget, um, and um, uh, you know, continuing to um, uh, progress out some of our critical business cases, such as uh, the spy lines on the agenda today. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, all of the other points in your paper are actually picked up in, in reports um, as we go through through the day, uh, major projects, um, uh, Tepapoya Birthing uh, Centre and additional discussion around that, uh, the SPIRE project, that all comes later on. So if there's a level of comfort, Karen, you've got a question? Um, yeah, just under that section on page 16, major capital projects, um, I'm not sure, I don't know if this is later, I don't think it's later in the papers, but the proposal to relieve the pressure on ED, um, that third paragraph down, yeah. talks about co-locating MAPU. And I was yeah. just interested to understand how co-locating MAPU would relieve pressure on the ED and wondered where it was going to be co-located to. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so it's, it's and, not, not the same thing. So they're two different things, Karen. So the, um, so the proposal to relieve pressure is for the um, demountable or pilot designs and extending those, so not only do they provide a space for the EDOA to be located, but also then to have a pod that um, uh, brings MAPU from the ward environment into another pod. So that, look, they'll, they'll be all joined, but they'll be sort of um, co-located. Okay, so that's two separate pieces of work, is it? Yes, yeah, so we're going to provide more sp space and co-locate MAPU. I guess the thing about MAPU being co-located is it becomes, um, we're looking at the size of it um, and also how we can get people um, more quickly from the ED into the MAPU. Okay, can I just ask where, where is it being co-located to? Because I couldn't see that in the other reports. So the proposal that we had around pods was that there's pods that have been designed to sit 
butter, buttered up to the ED. Sorry, no, my question relates to MEPU, um, co-locating MEPU. In the pods. Oh, so that will come down. Okay, I'm with you now. Okay, are there any other questions? No. Okay, so we've got the CEO's report and the recommendations to note the Minister's letter of expectations, which we're all aware of, and that's attached to the agenda, and uh, note the update for key local, regional, and national matters. So I'll move that. Is there a seconder? Seconder, Jenny, I put that in favour. Please say aye. 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 Thanks, carried. Thanks, everybody. So we'll now move to the financial report. Financial report to the end of February. <laughs> Very different now, but the financial report to the end of February. Um, now, I saw Daryl there somewhere. Daryl? Hi there. Is it Neil there as well? Good morning. Um, good morning. Sorry, mate, you're just a bit far away. I couldn't quite get right yeah, off. Yeah, it's impossible to see people in that ground floor meeting room. Sorry, Nikki, if you can... No, that's all right. There. We've got it. I, I hadn't spotted Neil. I, I saw Daryl come in. Right, yeah. welcome, team. We're in your hands. Okay, so um, I guess the, the trend in terms of uh, the year-to-date year result is um, we're still tracking on budget at, as at the end of uh, February. Um, February itself was um, a pretty good month. Actually, we were 335,000 favourable to budget with uh, um, largely related to revenue offset by um, uh, expenses. Um, look, happy to take questions. Um, uh, but I'll take the year report as read. That was pretty easy. <laughs> uh, I, I think um, probably just the other comment I'll make is obviously um, at this point in time, that COVID-19 was just something that was emerging. Um, and uh, uh, going forward, it, it will have an impact. But in terms of February itself, uh, there was really no impact of COVID-19 at that point. Um, we were starting to get um, an inkling of some of the costs that were likely to come through, but they all hit typically in March. So, Brendan, I saw Karen had her hand raised in Matarua. Okay, thanks, Karen, in Matarua. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the report. Um, I did have one question, which is on page 35 at the bottom there, and it relates to the provider payments. The last paragraph, I didn't really understand fully. So the adverse, um, the 1.4 million that's adverse to budget from contract payments, um, I was just wondering if I could get an understanding about that because it didn't quite make sense to me. You will basically um, uh, provide payments for that particular month where we're greater than what we actually budgeted for, but we have the revenue also. So it's typically money coming in and going out. And we had more money coming in than we anticipated and, and more revenue, uh, sorry, more expenditure going out for um, uh, community provider payments. Okay. Okay, thank you. Matero. Where's my time? Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, tēnā koe, John Motu Karakia. E koro ai kia tātou, tēnā koe. Um, kia ora koutou, tēnā koe. Um, so I just wanted to understand, because we had talked before about the impact of COVID-19 on the financials and the use of the specific code for that, and I wondered how did that um, fit with the forecast operating deficit. So, some view of that. So the, uh, that's, that was, that's come through the first time in the March result, where we had 943,000 direct impact COVID-19 costs um, impacting um, onto the, the PNL. Some of that is picked up into the um, into the specific cost for COVID-19. Some of it, for instance, the inability to deliver elective revenue at this point is going through the PNL. Where we get to at the end of the year will be very dependent upon whether the ministry picks up absolutely all or only most or what portion they pick up of all of those impacts. The one thing which is a little harder to, to um, pick up is that we were tracking very, very well, as you will have seen up to the year to date, February. Uh, on a month by month basis, we were tracking very closely to budget, a little over, a little under, pretty much on that line. Um, that's gone off a little bit now, and that will be because you cannot run a business um, that needs to be within a point something percent of, of expenditure, two point something percent of expenditure 
while you're also dealing with the impact of something which is quite disruptive, such as COVID-19. So very hard to track exactly where it hits, but you just know that we will go off song a little bit on other areas that we just can't get there. Um, absent COVID-19, the 12.1 looks exactly where we're heading, maybe just a little bit better. Um, with COVID-19, um, we're going to be what the ministry is funding us. Thanks, Neil. Um, uh, yes, I can see that uh, obviously in the absence of COVID, uh, the performance was fantastic and, uh, you know, mihi to all of um, the kaimahi from the DHB. I guess I am interested in being able to track more of the impact of COVID-19 and to be able to delineate that. Are you suggesting that that will be available perhaps at the next board meeting as we tease out those costs and look where they can be attributed directly to COVID-19 or we pick them up into our overrun. So, um, so if I might just add in there, um, Matira, so we, we had a very small, as you will have seen, um, page or, you know, three quarters of a page in the report on COVID-19. Correct. Um, but um, what we're hoping to do is build that out, as you suggest, so we can be a lot clearer um, around the specifics. Um, it, you know, it's quite complex. There are impacts that might not seem as obvious, such as the loss of revenue from visitors and staff related to car parking on site. Um, you know, things that are not in the track at that we're providing to the ministry, for example. So um, I think it would be fair that at the next board meeting we would have a lot further detail on that. We'll also have, I think, a lot more um, guidance from the ministry, uh, hopefully around those things that we can assume and not assume around planned care. So, of course, the reduction in elective surgery has had a significant impact on our revenue. Um, that'll be planned key revenue from the ministry, but we'll be a little bit unclear on the extent to which um, you might recall we usually have a sort of a net, netted off sort of neutral position around into district flows, our outflows and our inflows usually balance. We may potentially, that balance may shift so that we've got more inflow than outflow, but um, it's a little early for us to know all of those impacts. Thank you, Kath. It's great. I look forward to seeing that. Jenny? Yes, thank you. Um, so my question does relate directly to February. And Neil, um, you were saying that the budget is, is tracking overall how we would want it. And COVID aside, it is tracking to how we would um, expect it to track. Um, month, you know, forecast as well. So does that include to Ururohi, so mental health and addictions and the significant um, sort of variances that we continue to, to see? So are you saying that we're, we actually are forecasting for those um, continued variances? Yes, Jenny, that is correct. So we, we have three areas of p &L challenge. One, one is in the mental health, one is in the acute and elective. And, and the third is in the cancer treatment drugs, the PCTs, which um, were significantly over budget and which there might be some offset that we won't see until um, closing the books at the end of the year or possibly not until after we've closed the books, um, as sometimes happens. Um, so those, those three areas we are absorbing at the moment and other areas are, um, are outperforming in order to actually offset those. And I expect that that pattern would pretty much continue give or take the disruption that we're seeing at the moment. Yeah, I just note that each month we speak to, um, it becomes about containment and that there's some controls in place. Each month we're continuing to see really large um, negative variances there. Um, yeah, so that, that's why I just think that that's worth continuing to, to note. Um, and then on page 29, I just, you know, was I guess to see it there graphed again, the expenditure for this year compared to last year is really is quite significant. So not only are we well above, um, you know, I guess what we budgeted, the, we're so um, far above what last year's actual expenditure was as well. 
So the um, allowing for the fact that that graph has got its its bottom um, two point two million dollars, um, yeah. um, you know, cut off it. Um, the uh, that there have been significant up uplifts that are factored into um, thinking around the um, the cost coming from some of the big mega increases, which are in there. They were a big step change from the, from the preceding year. Um, that's the major issue. But the, the, clearly the key thing that is actually impacting that result is the difficulty in dealing with um, a, a different approach to high uh, challenging um, consumers, particularly those that would um, otherwise be uh, maybe dealt with through a period of seclusion, instead of which we have a very high level of uh, assistance from healthcare assistance and so forth, um, increase of workforce capacity to deal with um, behaviours in, in a way that might um, not traditionally have been so. Yeah, so Neil, would it be fair to say we have budgeted quite differently with the following year to sort of allow for those factors so we don't continue to see such large variances? That is true up to an extent, and that is, I think, that the, the, um, um, the ops and political execs are, are still working on making sure they've got that well, well managed. Um, we, we need to actually design um, how we're going to deal with that then budget for the design, not budget for something else. But certainly, you know, thinking that we can actually um, get by with the labour costs that we had, say, two years ago, you know, merely uplifted from makers or something, but no more FTEs. Uh, I don't think it's quite realistic under the circumstances. But it is a benefit that I am hoping, and we're working on the, the um, staffing model of the new mental health unit almost as we speak, we're, we're trying to work that out. It is one of those areas where we would hope to get a change in the way we can deal with some of those challenging patients uh, in, in the long term. Thank you. Okay, has everybody had a go there? No other questions. Can I just, um, uh, guys, can we just go to page 30? Um, and there's that observation, and I know it was last year, but I just still want to pick it up again, where there was the potential for an arrangement with the Haw Hawks Bay um, DHB, and and they chose to not proceed. My question is, is, is there any, any opportunity to recover that? Um, so, Brendan, we, we are getting that funded. It's just in a different mechanism. Ah, okay, okay. I saw Vaughan had his hand up too, Brendan. Say again. Uh, Vaughan. Oh, sorry. Had his hand up, sorry. Oh, thank, thank you, thank you. Sorry, Vaughan. Uh, can you turn your thing on, your talky thing? Hello? Hello? Vaughan, you're on mute. No, he's not. He's on mute, but he's on mute, not on mute. Your, your microphone doesn't seem to be working. That's a good trick. <laughs> <laughs> I think that meant move on. We did this kind of a thing. Move on. <laughs> oh, okay. You want to write it on a piece of paper and hold it up to the screen. Sorry, mate. Okay. Um, is there anybody else? Rightio, so hold on, bear with me. Um, so I suppose the observation that we would make on the financials is that, is that if this was just business as usual, we'd be pretty happy with where we were landing, but we know in fact that next time we meet, um, the picture's not going to be quite as rosy. Um, so I'll go back to the recommendations which are there to note and observe. Uh, is somebody prepared to move accordingly? Lou, okay. Lou will move. Thank okay. you. And who was the seconder? Oriana. Thanks, Oriana. So it's been moved and seconded um, accordingly. I'll put that in favour. Please say aye. Against, it's carried. Aye. Rightio. Now we've got um, the performance improvement plan. Um, is Doug on? I, I haven't seen Doug. Who's no, doing this? That's, that's not uh, available today, so I'm giving Thanks, it Judith. Fantastic. Thank you. Ed, you happy for me to start, Brendan? Please, Judith. Yeah. Uh, Morena Board, 
Good morning. Um, just wanted to first of all um, outline the February position in the report and then make a number of comments around the COVID position and how that might affect our performance improvement plan. So I will take the report as read but just highlight a couple of positives and the ongoing areas of challenge in terms of our performance. Um, so as at the end of February, um, our um, areas of improvement were in our acute flow and our performance against the shorter stays target. We also saw increasing levels of performance in terms of our readmission rates um, and also um, consistently good performance in our fractured neck of femur patients being um, provided with surgery within the recommended 40 hour period. Those are three particular highlights. Um, in terms of the major areas of challenge, we continue to see some challenges in the delivery of SV5, which is our surgical waiting time target. And um, the pattern and reasons are consistent with uh, previous reports. Um, and our other area of um, challenge is in delivering savings, um, which are outside of budget, so our improvements um, relating to savings uh, for future years continue to be an area which we are challenged in. Um, I would also like to just note that we are continuing to work with analytics to ensure that this data is available looking at it through an equity lens and that work is ongoing at this time. Um, moving on a little bit to think about the impact of the COVID position. Um, there are some areas which are likely to see um, a dip in performance, that's likely to be SV5 and our um, delivery to our production plans or our case weight targets. Um, those are related to the same matters that Kath highlighted earlier in her report. And the impact on SB2 is still a little bit unclear. We don't yet have the data to the end of March, um, but I'm hoping that that will not have been impacted as greatly um, as the other two may have been. Um, in terms of areas where we might actually see some upside with regards to this position in terms of our performance, I would say that I would expect to see um, ongoing improvements in our um, shorter stays target. Um, and also our, um, hopefully our 28 day readmissions rate will continue to see improvements. The um, relative stay index, which is a measure that's only, only, only measured every quarter by the Health Roundtable, we've still to see um, the latest data come in on that, but I, I would hope that that might see some improvement over this period. And I also just want to comment on the data relating to um, follow-up um, uh, remediation which was drawn to your attention last year we are seeing continued improvement in those figures and uh, the latest results are quite promising and we continue to make good progress in that remediation area um, the ongoing areas in terms of our future plans around initiatives that could be impacted by COVID um, relate to some of the matters in our quality and reducing variation area and also in the initiatives in progress to support savings targets. Um, these are largely related to the fact that in order to make progress in these areas, we need to engage clinicians and managers, and at the moment their um, time is um, naturally prioritised into the COVID response. Um, and the other area I anticipate to see a deterioration would be in our annual leave accrual um, for similar related matters that are reported in your papers um, around people not being able to take annual leave over this period. Um, I'll leave it at that. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thanks, Judith. Rightio, so I think, uh, so Lou and then Karen, please. Go, Lou. If you turn your do for on. There you go. Um, going on to page 50, uh, with the acute rehabilitation pathway, you, you state there there's been some changes to OPAL. What are those changes, please? Thank you. Um, I'll just go to that section. Um, there's been no changes to the way that OPAL operates in terms of negative changes. What I think you're describing or seeing there our ongoing areas of improvement opportunity. 
So the two areas I think you're referring to, Lou, will be the acute to rehabilitation pathway, which looks at how we can um, uh, rapidly move patients from the acute sector into the rehabilitation um, services that they need yeah. out into the community. So we're doing some ongoing um, work in that area with that particular cluster. Um, to reduce the delays in that period to, to deliver better outcomes for those patients. And yeah. the other area is in terms of acute to age residential care, which um, is another pathway we're looking to make some improvements in um, so that, the, again, the delays in, in, trans, in, in, um, in transitioning patients through to an age residential care setting are minimised wherever they are possible. And that relates primarily to our NASC process um, and our pathway relating to um, the staff that undertake that exercise. Um, so there are actually ongoing improvements to reduce the amount of time that some of our more complex patients are in an acute bed. Okay, so there are improvements. Thank you. I just wanted to know what that were. Thank you. Thanks, Lou. Uh, Karen? Thank you. Um, just on page 49 in that um, chart um, under savings plan, um, the section under infrastructure talks about the depreciation reductions from the sale of assets. And I'm just interested to know what assets we've, we're selling. Now, I'd be better of handing that on to either um, Daryl or um, Neil to give that answer, and so I will. Um, so that's actually mislabeled. It, it should be uh, depreciation savings as a result of uh, uh, delays in the capital expenditure plan. So the original plan was uh, rephased. And as a, as a consequence of that, the depreciation um, impact had, uh, was, was lowered. Um, on top of that, we've actually had even a, a more delayed uh, capital expenditure plan. Um, so you know, it's, a, it's a actually added additional savings as a consequence. Okay, that makes more sense. Thank you. <clears throat> Brilliant. Are there any other questions uh, related to this item? Yes. Yes, please, Brendan. Sorry, guys. I'm sorry. Yes, please, I can't. Brendan. So, who's next? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I... I'll go. Much I'm sorry, right? sorry Matua. Right? It's all good. Um, you're doing great. I didn't find you. <laughs> um, uh, Morena, um, uh, Judith, I just wanted to ask a question. It kind of relates to the discussion about to Uru Rohi in the previous paper. And I wondered, uh, is there an intention to have uh, that cluster included in the program improvement plan going forward, given it seems that you've been working on a number of initiatives across clusters that could also um, be scaled and have benefit and help with some of the pressures and um, and also some of the savings required in that area? Yes, it's a very good question. Thank you, Mataroa. Um, the answer would be yes. So the performance improvement plan um, should look across our organisation. Um, this time last year when we made this plan, we had a particular focus on the flow and um, aspects of um, our performance in terms of our production plan and our um, acute measures um, more related to acute and elective um, in that particular cluster. But um, as we move forward, we should be um, reviewing that plan and we're about to do that now so that next year's plan um, looks at different areas um, and is a, it, you know, it may well need to focus more strongly on the mental health cluster. Um, but this plan was approved about this time last year. So. But it's a very good point, and thank you for making it. And in Thanks. saying that, though, I would add, though, that there are a number of cross-district health board initiatives in this plan that incorporate uh, mental health as a part of the district health board. So if you were looking at, um, you know, some of the workforce and culture, for example, initiatives, they don't exclude uh, any of the clusters. Similarly, when you look at... Um, um, this, you know, some of the savings plan in budgets around reproductions that was um, in the one of the areas was mental health. Um, 
recruitment and relocation costs, etc. So I think the bit that you're probably going to, Matiro, is more in the service design and delivery bit, which Judith is quite rightly saying might be more of a focus going forward. That's Brilliant. great. Okay. Thanks, Matiro. Now, John, were you next? Uh, all covered, thank you. So is there anybody else? Right, okay, we've got everybody covered. So we can go back to the um, go back to the recommendations on page 41, uh, which to note and endorse on the performance improvement plan. So I'll move that as a seconder. Yes. Oh, gee, I wish I could see everybody. Who was sick? Somebody wait, somebody give me a something or rather. Matiroa. Uh, thank you, Matiroa, thank you. So I moved and second, I put that in favor, please say aye. Aye. And again, it's carried, thanks everybody. Got you twice right. in the way, Vaughan. I'm trying to figure out what, what's going on here. <laughs> that, say that. We've got Vaughan, Vaughan in two different places now. Raffaella and Vaughan. <laughs> I was thinking, who's Raffaella? <laughs> Hang on, does he get two votes? Still can't hear you. You're on mute on Raffaella now. You need to unmute Raffaella. <laughs> Right, with that, with that interlude, I'm not quite sure what it meant, but anyway, um, we're moving to the external audit, engagement letter and audit plan. Now, Bruno is part of this somewhere. I can't find him at the moment, but I'm sure you're there, Bruno. But initially, Neil, this is your, um, your piece of work. So, bloody hell. Um, right, Neil. So, uh, just briefly to introduce, so Bruno is uh, Melissa has now finished her time on our audit and um, by um, hand, hand the reins across to Bruno, who's picking up as the audit engagement part partner um, for the next um, remaining two years of the three year appointment uh, of Deloitte. Um, there are any, um, so Bruno, um, I'll pass you a minute to talk your way through your focus and the key issues that the board um, might not be aware of. The um, thing which is required for the board of this having reviewed that is to um, approve the order plan and to authorise Brendan to sign it on behalf of the board. Right, yeah. So, so thanks for that um, introduction, Neil. Um, I'm not sure that at this point we go into a deep and meaningful discussion, I, I, I don't think, but I'm happy to hear from anybody who has a view. Uh, Brendan, if I, if I could just maybe, um, just I don't think we need to do a full page turn of, of every page of the document, you could take it as read, but just um, yep. to kind of introduce myself as um, your new appointed auditor. I, I'm not totally new to the DHB. I was um, your appointed auditor from 2009 to 2014. So um, rotated off and Melissa did six years. So I'm back um, hopefully for another six years. So good to be back on the audit. Uh, Lucy will still be the manager. So we do have continuity and we'll try to keep as much continuity in the audit team as possible as well. Um, the audit plan was pulled together um, just using the history of knowledge from prior audits, um, talking to the Auditor General and looking at their sector brief of issues in the sector. Um, having said that, the, the audit plan was prepared um, a month ago, so we haven't taken into account uh, COVID-19 and the implications that will have uh, for the DHB, but um, we will build that into the, our audit when, when we um, do carry out the audit. So um, I think we do cover off um, the key risk areas. I think probably that the only two that, that I'd probably mention um, as the, the bigger ones um, is the leave pay provision, which um, landed up with a qualification last year. So we, we will obviously look at that in detail again this year. And then the other topical point um, that's been topical over the last couple of years is the valuation of, of the, the land and buildings, which uh, your last revaluation was in 2018. Um, the standards do require you to assess whether there has been a material movement in, in the values in the years between valuations. And, and if there has, uh, you should carry out a revaluation. So we, we'll probably look to um, Neil and Daryl just to, to make sure that's that's covered off. Um, but other than that, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, being back on the audit and uh, reporting back to the board um, or the audit committee um, post the audit. But um, at this point, happy to take any questions on the audit plan. Brilliant, Bruno, thank you. 
Uh, at this early stage, are there any any questions? Mataroa? Uh, thank you, um, Morena, um, Tinakwe Bruno. Um, firstly, I just wanted to uh, ask, and perhaps it could just come to us via email, but I, re I recognise and realise that the board uh, signed, the previous board signed off the plan and the costs. Um, as a board member, I'd just like to know what the costs are because I'm not aware of that. Um, so that would be great. Thank you very much. Um, secondly, I just, I've uh, read the information and thank you very much, Bruno. I guess I was just kind of interested about, um, I'm trying to think about how to get the thought out of my head and make sense to everybody on the screen. Um, but I'm kind of thinking about, there are some implications under the treaty and the settlements and the Y2575 that relate to financial performance of DHBs um, and expectations of the Crown in regard to these processes. You know, don't see anything in the audit um, program or illuminated in the documentation in respect to this area of consideration. So I would be interested to um, hear, Bruno, if this is something that could be further discussed at a future point, perhaps when we're all able to be around a table, or if you could perhaps um, undertake a bit of research to see where these considerations might be being pulled across into audits otherwise. Um, I think um, just just to cover off the first question, uh, there was an audit proposal um, which is signed off for three years, and, and Daryl and Neil should should have a copy of that, uh, which includes uh, the fees. Um, that does go through a process with the Auditor General and, and benchmarked across the uh, DHBs um, around the country. Um, the second question um, um, is. Um, I suppose the, the cop out is um, our, our primary responsibility is is to audit the financial statements and give an opinion on whether they fairly present the position of the district health board. So um, we, we are just looking more um, at it from the auditing standards and accounting standards perspective that, that you are complying with those. Um, compliance with um, other legislation like that may be um, covered um, at, a, at a high level and um, any um, non-financial reporting around um, um, healthcare for, for Maori is, is looked at um, as part of um, that audit. But um, I'm not sure whether that covers off um, everything you were expecting, that's right? Um, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Thank you, Bruno. Um, I think that the critical thing here is that Auditor General sets the um, areas of focus of the audits um, and Audit New Zealand um, uh, is responsible for determining who our external auditors are. And I wonder if what you're talking about sits in two areas. One is that Audit New, audit New Zealand or the Office of the Auditor General might choose to undertake a special review around um, Y2575 compliance when, when there's clarity from government on its policy settings and then its expectations in terms of those. Thanks, Kay, um, and thank you, Bruno. Um, I guess it, it is a bit of a strategic um, thinking. I understand the process of who appoints who. Um, I'm pleased that you premised your response, Bruno, with a bit of a cop-out, um, <laughs> so that <laughs> you obviously might be able to have a further look at that domain and see whether or not there's a point of discussion later on. So I appreciate that. Yeah, Thank you. Well done. That's well, done Matara. well done. Brendan, it's John, John here. Uh, my Please, concern, John. Uh, yes, uh, and it's addressing this topic. Um, although the um, public benefit entities um, is one of financial reporting, I think ours is one of governance. And I think we need to know that they fairly represent the state of the District Health Board. And in terms of equity, I think we need to be assured that fairness or that fair representation extends to what our duty is in terms of governance. So I wonder if the other matter that though where the board should be thinking about this is in the internal audit process. And so we have our internal audit of equity um, currently being undertaken by 
the internal auditors. So, and that may or may not um, go to the questions that board members have. And in which case we should look at that scope and give some more thought to how we can go forward in this space. I think the internal audit process gives us, gives the board as governance much more scope in this space. Okay, I think that's okay. fairly, I think that should be fairly noted, um, Kath, and, and obviously we need to extend the discussion in this, in this space. Did that work? Yes. Oh, good. Okay, right out. Okay, so I think, just bear with me, everybody. So other than Gabriel scratching her head, nobody else has a question? No, rightio. <laughs> Sorry, Kev. Uh, rightio, so we can go back then now to the external audit engagement letter and audit plan to note and approve. So we're noting the plan and approving that the chair can sign the engagement letter. Somebody prepared to move? Thanks, Karen, second Maturaa. Put that in favor, please say aye against. It's carried. Aye. Right, we're now moving to the next um, item, which is to appoint the internal auditors. So we're on page 92. Sorry, Brendan, I'll, uh, I'll drop off at this point and uh, look forward to reporting back to you um, after the audit. Brilliant, Brendan. Thank you very, very much for engaging and looking forward to meeting you in person at some Great. stage. All right. Thank Cheers. you, everyone. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Um, right. Neil? So the uh, papers uh, with you, the key issue, two key issues, I think, to consider are um, first, whether or not we are comfortable um, continuing with um, central um, TAS as our internal order provider. And the second question then is to note that although they've kept their rate at a, a quite a reasonable rate um, for a number of years now, that they are under significant financial pressure from that, and they're proposing that they should uh, raise their rate um, to what is still actually very reasonable with discount on what market uh, rates would be for this sort of work. To give you some context around the latter of those questions first, I think, the, um, we've observed over the last several years when uh, TAS has had a, a difficulty in delivering work on time, that they are under-resourced and they are actually um, stretching the resource they've got to both deliver audit and to try and manage the delivery of audit, the portfolio work. And I know at times we've been bringing in specialists to do specialist areas that they're actually delivering that. Uh, they're paying more for the resource coming in than we're actually paying them for it. On balance, I don't think what they're asking for in terms of a change in rate is unfair. Uh, and indeed, I'm, I've been personally quite concerned for a couple of years now that they can't actually achieve the, uh, the level that we're asking for in terms of performance, unless we're actually providing them with the resource in terms of costs and capability to do that. Uh, so taking that then into the second, um, we've, um, we've, we've actually come up against the question from time to time, are they delivering what we need to deliver? Um, um, my personal view is that Compared to alternatives, um, the shortcomings of TAS are probably quite minor, um, relative to what I've heard some of my colleagues around the region um, comment yep. on. That doesn't mean to say that we should stay with them forever, um, but I recommend to the board that this is possibly not the, the right time to go through that particular disruption. It might be a better time in the future to go back to, to basics and, and reconsider what options we've got, um, together with others around the region. Thanks, Neil. Um, I have to say I agree with that. Um, are there any comments? I don't imagine there's anybody. Muriel? Um, th thank you, Brendan, and thank you, Neil, for the report. Um, I just have one question, and I note in the paper that it talks about the benefits of being able to benchmark. Do we actively benchmark with our um, colleague um, DHBs within our region? So in terms of what I would, uh, you might be thinking of there in terms of a, a, a more comprehensive benchmarking um, program of different metrics, um, you know, um, in a, a formalised sense, we don't have that such a program in place. It's been a long-running program for several years to try and get something to happen 
but we, we have um, uh, always had other priorities ahead of that, I have to say. Um, and right now, it might again be one of those times where everyone's so disrupted, you're never going to benchmark anything to a fine degree. However, um, TAS, when they're looking at a particular area of work, do go and look at comparatives. So they do know what's happening because they're doing a lot of other DHBs, not just within this region, they're doing work in other regions as well. They have access to the ability to look at what other people are achieving and to feed that into their thinking, into their recommendations. And from time to time, they bring in people who are experts from other regions to come and take a look at an area for us, uh, which is effectively bringing a, a benchmarking approach to that. Thank you, Neil. And my other question is, um, we've been doing, I think in the last few years, six audits per year. Is that the thinking again going forward when we get to planning the audit program? So that would, um, I think, be a conversation for, we'll normally go to the next FRAC um, 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 committee um, as we propose up a plan. And it, I think it comes down to a balance between the number of audit days we want to pay for and the number, the size, the gruntiness, if you like, of the individual audits. Um, so we can do more audits that were actually a little bit easier to address more of a, um, a, 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 a lot of lightweight audits, but you know, um, more discrete um, pieces, or we can do fewer audits of um, some pretty deep um, investigation of some areas. I think at the moment, the round about six, you know, five to seven, I think we've got a balance there that's about the right size. Um, not too much, not too little not too light, not too um, intensive where your resources are going through one thing. Okay, thank you, Neil. Thanks, Muriel. Uh, Brenda? Anybody else? Yes, sorry, Matiroa. Matiroa. Uh, aroha mai, tēnā kui, Neil, thank you for the explanation. I was just wondering, um, as a part of the audit program, would um, TAS be doing the equity audit for the organisation? So TAS have been engaged as part of that program. They are um, utilize, they utilize um, resources outside of their own um, staffing um, to do that. They've actually been, um, so Tracy's been working uh, with me in terms of making sure that the resources that come to that are in fact appropriate, that, the, that there aren't any issues there, that we think will be a good quality outcome, and indeed particularly the scope of that work is what we need it to be. That's fantastic, because yes, it, uh, it would seem on the limited knowledge that I have seen about TAS that they don't necessarily have the expertise in relation to things Māori to do that. So it's great to hear that they're um, collaborating with the DHB on that. So Tracy um, is the lead executive in the DHB because that's a live audit as we speak, Matiro, um, that audit is happening at the moment um, and that will come up to the audit, the financial audit and risk committee at a point that that committee's meeting as well. Tracy, you want to add to that? Um, I'm really sorry, Kath, but um, we're, uh, we've been having conversations, Neil and I, with uh, Taz and we can't find the right auditor for that work at the moment. And that's um, an issue around costs. So Neil and I are, um, are challenging Taz about that as we speak. But we, yeah, we've got, we've got to find an auditor for the money that we've got. Okay. Okay, okay. sorry, I wasn't up with the play on that one, but um, I guess that goes to your point, Matiro, making sure that we do have the right skills when we're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Apologies. Okay. That's all right. You guys Thank will work you. that out. Oriana. Uh, kia ora, Brendan. I just want to add to Matiru's quarter. We did bring up at the at the regional orientation about the need to increase the Māori component at TES, and this audit function was one of those issues we raised. Kia ora. Right, brilliant. Okay, thank you. So, a good question, and we've got a we've got a lot more clarity there as a consequence of it. So, and and appropriately noted. So, um, the. And Neil, thanks for the explanation. I don't think anybody will disagree. It's a pretty modest um, increase, and I agree wholeheartedly that right now is not the time to change. Uh, we need to stick with the with the team that we currently know. Uh, so I'm assuming that I've I'll just do a double check. Nobody else has a question. No, no. Vaughan, uh, Vaughan in all seriousness, I know that you can't um, communicate, but if you want to text a message or whatever, feel free to do that. 
and I can just pick it up and well text it to me or Keith so we you know I feel a bit uncomfortable you're not being able to participate but if you want to do that just do it um, and Kay are welcome on board um, so going back now to the appointment of the auditors uh, to note and approve um, Somebody prepared to move and second that. So I'm, move happy to, right. I'm happy to move it. Could we also, though, capture the point about the Māori expertise, please? Can we, can we take that as noted, Mataroa? Yes, I think we it's can. Very clearly noted. So, um, so Mataroa moves and, and we mm, note the particular go. issue um, <laughs> that we need to get in terms of uh, 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 auditor skill. And a seconder? Muriel. Um, Muriel will second it. Okay, thank you. So I moved and seconded. I'll put that in favour, please say aye. Against, it's carried. So we're now moving, we're now moving to the staff engagement um, survey. It's on no, screen 95. And Kayu, welcome. We're in your hands. Thank you. Good morning and nice to see all of you. Um, this paper talks about providing with information on conducting the staff survey the last survey was conducted in 2018. And this is a major piece of work as part of our people plan. This is a staff engagement survey. The paper talks about using the same survey instrument that we had used previously, mainly because one, we can benchmark against the questions and the results that we had from the last survey. Also, it is a survey instrument that is still used across six DHBs, so has some validity within, within the sector. Um, the paper talks about building on the learnings that we have, um, that, that we kind of learned from the previous survey and, and provide some indicative timelines. Um, we are very conscious of the time when this paper was written versus where we are now, um, but we will be mindful of any changes and how things progress, both in the industrial environment as well as the other environment that we're currently living in. Um, and therefore, I call this as an indicative timeline. So um, that's what the paper is about. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. I think Oriana's got the first question in this space. Oh, kia ora, Brendan. Uh, you go to... Sorry? Uh, my screen keeps freezing, so Jenny's going to, to ah. cover the questions that we've got. Okay, okay. Um, Jenny, there you go. Jenny? <laughs> Hi, kia ora. Um, yeah, I'm just speaking for Audi because she's having a few technical difficulties, can hear us fine, but communicating is a bit challenging. So look, we just had a question around the um, ethnicity in particular being a voluntary field. We just um, felt or that it was worth discussion around all we're trying to achieve in the equity space and in our workforce space and, and growing that to be able to um, pinpoint to ethnicity in particular for our Māori workforce, their responses and, and feelings would be quite useful. So that was the part that I think stuck out, stood out to us as, as a concern. I'm happy to take that on board and make that um, mandatory if, if, if required. Some of the things that, one of the reasons why we don't try and narrow it down too much is because of the overall perception of staff that they would get identified. I mean, we can try it, um, but the more we make mandatory, I mean, the, the, the reason we had last, last time when we did it in 2018, a lot of it was just voluntary. Now, the problem with that is you cannot accurately slice and dice information. Um, so, but I do not believe that as a DHB, we are where we should be in terms of making everything um, uh, mandatory. However, I'm quite happy to take that on board. And if, if you so feel, I'm happy to take that into the mandatory area. Let's just we just hear from John. got the dreaded dry finger. Um, okay, um, this, the survey is voluntary, but I think in order to um, get good information, these people have to give this information freely. I think expl explaining the utility of, the inf uh, of how this information will be used in the survey, I think will be helpful. Making parts of the survey voluntary suggests that this information is less important I think ethnicity in terms of our workforce is very, very important because we have to know uh, the capacity as much as we're asking for TAS to um, be more responsive in terms of its capacity to report on things Māori 
and especially in terms of the audit process, I think in understanding our workforce, the imperative is the same. Thanks, take John. Point. I, I take your point, I will change it to mandatory. Oh, well, uh, the mandatory thing, um, it's a voluntary survey. So um, I think if you just take the voluntary sections out and just say, please just provide, provide this information because it's important that we know this. Um, I, I think it changes the, the um, way that staff will view the survey. Um, because you're saying that some, by making parts voluntary, you're saying that some things are more important than others. Okay. Okay, so that's, that's great discussions. Okay, you're comfortable with, with, the, with the proposition there to just remove that voluntary demographics line? Yes. Yes. Okay, now, somebody else? Uh, I just had a couple of points, Brenda. Yep, 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 yep. Found you. Right, oh. Matarawa. Of course. Oh, and Karen. <laughs> Matarawa and Karen. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kayu. Uh, I just really wanted to, um, I'm probably asking what is the obvious, but I just wanted to check in that um, in the summary section in respect to the paper, it uh, talks about that the survey is looking at uh, really the success of um, supporting staff to reach their full potential and the tools that are required for that. And I gather that then also seeks us um, you know, uh, reaching in for the staff's view on the culture with a little c of the organisation. So that's one of my points. And then um, I wondered, given, as you say, the situation that we are currently in, if we might also reach in and understand some of the impact of COVID-19 on our um, you know, on our most precious resource being our staff uh, and seeking to understand that in a way that can then be more supportive into the future. And I agree with the equity one. And I know sometimes people get a bit funny about, uh, well, I don't mean like ha-ha, but, you know, um, about recording ethnicity. So I did think you could just have, I don't wish to um, disclose scroll down box if people feel that way, accommodating that. So those two issues are about COVID-19 and about culture with a small C. Okay. You got that, Kaya? Yes, I have. I have taken that on board. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen? Thanks, Brendan. Look, I'm, I'm really pleased to see this going ahead and I'm particularly pleased to see that the tool that's being used is a consistent one with last time because I think there is value in being able to measure how we've progressed in that time. Um, just to add to the discussion that we've had in terms of the information that's collected, I guess I just want to highlight what I understood to be one of the barriers um, to participation last time and, and that was um, that staff felt that it was important that they were anonymous and that the information wouldn't kind of come back and bite them in some way. And I think the information around ethnicity and age and duration of employment sometimes could have the potential to make staff feel that they are able to be identified because if they've already said what team they're in and then they've said what ethnicity and age and how long they've worked there, then suddenly they may feel that they are identifiable. So I think the value in having these additional statistics needs to be weighed up alongside the um, value of having a high level of participation for the survey. So from my perspective, while I think it would be really valuable for us to collect this, I think keeping it voluntary does perhaps mean that if people do have that level of nervousness that they may um, well, not participate if that is um, mandatory, but may well participate if it's not. So, Karen, I think you've made a really valid point. I mean, um, I've been managing the survey in New Zealand almost every year, apart from the DHB sector, for about 14 years now, and that is one of the um, one of the most asked questions. Um, and especially when you start narrowing down um, the information, the uh, demographic information that you need. 
So what I'll do though is I, I do hear the sentiments of, of capturing the information. And there are organizations that make the whole survey information mandatory. That there are organizations that, that have such a culture that do that. And there is benefit. There is there is significant benefit in having a, a lot of this information well captured, etc. So what I'm going to do is um, spend some time thinking about how we can make this possible without um, without spooking people, because when people get spooked, they will basically not respond. It's only the questions that come to me that I can respond. But what I know is about 60% of the people will not even ask the question. They, they just not respond after that. And for, for us to get meaningful information from the survey, we do need to increase the participation level. We were pretty good last time at 47%, but we do need to increase that participation level. So it's that level of confidence that we have to build amongst our staff groups. I, 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 I would have to say that the timing for the survey right now couldn't be better. I think that the, 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 the COVID impact on our organisation in a constructive way, if you read, especially when we get to the next report, where we hear so much around the collegiality, the improvement, the relationship building, the teamwork that's been going on, all of that sort of stuff must add enormous value to what we're trying to trying to achieve here. So I think time and KR is crucial and the more data collected, the better and the more comfort. If people aren't comfortable now to make a convent, um, I don't know when the heck they will be because this is absolutely a perfect storm for us to get, you know, real, real constructive input. So I hope that we can achieve that. Um, Muriel, so you want Brendan, to can I just ask, can I just clarify, because I can't, uh, I don't understand where we've gone with Kaya's response about ethnicity and Karen's comments. So I don't understand where we landed on that. What's I that think, approach? Maya, I think that Kaya has said um, that he wants to have a bit more thought about it. But in my head, my, my perception is that he's much more in favour of gathering greater information than than less, and and I, and I, and though Karen's ob the observation you made, Karen, around you know the nervousness, I think right now they they should be more comfortable than ever to be providing as much information as we can get. But um, I I have put words in Kay's mouth, so to be fair, Kay, you might want to. No, I think I think you're absolutely right, um, Brendan. I think the the challenge lies um, with me now to try and, and get to a position where we can capture this information in a safe way. Um, so I think even what Matsuro was saying about, you know, I do not want to provide this, I do not wish to um, disclose this information could be a possible explanation at some stage. So we'll, I just have to do a little more thinking about it. But the general sentiments I do get, there is, there is benefit in capturing information. Definitely. Are you comfortable with that Matsuro? Yeah, okay, right here. Right here, have we, I think we've covered everybody, Muriel. Thank, thank you, Brendan. And thank you, Kaya, for the, the update. Um, like Karen said, it's good to see this going ahead, and I appreciate what the challenges are of trying to get participation up at meaningful levels. And I just wondered what we've learned from um, the other DHBs that use the same tool. And, um, for example, looking at the ethnicity discussion, do they do they collect that routinely? Um, and what are some of the things that we might have learned from them that would help us? And then secondly, have we got, for example, um, an opportunity to use the unions to help us um, with um, building confidence of staff that, that this is an anonymous process? So I think really good point there. Um, I know Auckland for one have all the fields mandatory and they've got a pretty high response rate. So that is quite heartening to know. Um, to support this, this information and how we go uh, about capturing this information, which just means that we will have to have a more um, uh, consistent communication campaign and use all communication channels that we have formal as well as informal to actually pass this message and to increase participation. Um, in terms of union buy-in and support, um, they, they, we have spoken to the unions. We do speak to them on a regular basis about this. And I have solicited their support and they are, they are quite supportive 
of um, of you know you know they'll be they'll be going out to the membership and talking to them about participating in the survey. I know that CMS for one combined medical staff are really looking forward to this and they'll be pushing the survey from from their um, perspective as well. Okay, I think we're pretty good. General nodding of heads. Heather, are you happy to move the resolution? Where's Heather? Here. Hi. Yes, I can. I'm happy to move the resolution. Brilliant. I'm happy and, to second. And seconded by John. I put that in face. So that's to uh, note the costs, note the changes, approve the survey, and improve the time and approve the timeline. I put that in favour. Please say aye. Again, aye. It's carried. Uh, well done, Kay. Thank you. Thank you. We're going really well for time, team. Should do this more often. <clears throat> I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> uh, so is Kelly on? I can't. No. Um, Brendan, can I make a suggestion that we do the Holidays Act paper um, now, and then I'll talk to the COVID paper. Okay. Just, so while we've still got Daryl on the um, on the Zoom. All right, okay, so we'll go to 123 and we're going to the Holidays Act Compliance. And where's Daryl? Daryl, there we go, found you. Right, are you happy to leave um, off yeah. on that? Yep, happy to lead off on that. So uh, what we have is the paper just introducing the Holidays Act and the uh, yep. process that we have to go through, um, sort of a three-step phase of, of review, re uh, rectification, re remediation. We're kind of in the um, um, prep stage, moving into uh, review. Um, we've, um, I guess part of the process has been difficult because we've just the resources and the expertise that we're required to uh, get this off up and running. We've got a really good uh, project manager. We're really pleased with the uh, with the progress that she has made. Her name is uh, Debbie uh, Bellamy. Um, we are uh, in terms of um, the all the unions we have uh, heard feedback from um, over half, just over half of them now. So just as part of the um, the steering group, there's a requirement to have unions involved in that, which is which is great to have them on, uh, have them on board. So we're planning on having that first steering group um, meeting just before the uh, before the end of this month. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is the auditors and who we bring on board for that. We've got a proposal from the um, from one um, uh, auditor um, who has got um, experience uh, with this um, across a number of other DHBs as well. Um, so we should be finalising that um, uh, this week and bringing them on board. Um, some of the actions that we're doing at the moment obviously is, is preparing for the review process. Um, working through um, extracts of data uh, from the payroll system so we can work through the necessary steps to confirm our, um, I guess, where we sit against the, uh, the baseline uh, document which was signed by um, the uh, DHB chief executives uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, the other, there's another side piece of work which is about um, our, our payroll system and ensuring that that is capable of compliance. Right now it's not, um, so we do have to go through an upgrade process to uh, enable us to have the functionality to be able to ensure that uh, future payrolls is compliant once we understand what that means. So that's where we're at at the moment, I'm um, happy to take any questions. Okay, um, obviously for the for the board, for you know, it's a new board and they're probably not as up to speed as, um, you know, maybe ideally with the magnitude of this particular issue. Um, I, just, I just wonder, can, would it be useful just to explain? The background? Well, I'm just more interesting. So, if you look at the figure, there's 9.4 million. You know, with, with 10 million dollars, you put another 500 on there. Where does the? I'd like the board to understand. You know, where where is this funded from? What what's the impact on us? You know, just that little bit of that rounding out stuff. Sure. Just so they've got a bit sure. of an idea. 
So, so the, the whole issue goes back to, I guess, um, you know, it's been an issue right across the country since yep. sort of came out in 2015, where um, DHBs were asked, among, not just us, but um, right across um, New Zealand, employers were asked to, well, are there, are there were some emerging issues, and um, we were asked directly whether, you know, we had those issues as well. Um, and after a, a an audit, um, by the Labour Inspectorate of some DHBs, it became clear that there were issues in terms of how the Holidays Act was being treated. At that point, we thought our issue was small, but as time has gone on, we discovered that it's a, a lot larger. So at one point, we were reporting, I think, $33,000, um, then we went to three and a half. Uh, last year, we made provision, as all DHBs were, quite, were, were asked to do, um, which totaled um, just over $9 million. As a sector, the DHB sector as a whole, I believe it's, um, it's 750, around $750 million. So it is a massive, massive issue for the whole sector. Um, in terms of where it's going to be funded from, well, first thing, we've made a provision. So it was in last year's accounts. That doesn't mean to say that the issue stops there. It's continued on and will continue on until we uh, or until we um, have a compliance system up, up and running, if you like. Once we've got a compliance system running, then the, the fault effectively stops um, and that uh, whatever uh, we've calculated going backwards will have to be remediated. Um, so we are continuing to make adjustments to that provision that we made last year in this year's accounts. Um, in terms of where it's been funded, I guess, you know, when you have a look at the sector as a whole, $750 million at this point, um, there's no way um, DHB is going to be able to fund that out of their um, current um, uh, yep, uh, funds. And so it's the uh, DHBs as a whole are looking to government to fund this as a separate, uh, or would hope to, uh, that the, uh, that the uh, government will fund this as a separate exercise. Uh, I'm not clear where that is exactly or so what we're doing. So I, I think we've said to the board previously that the government have committed to funding this, mm -hmm. um, which is why they want us to always ensure that the provisions in our accounts are current and as accurate as they can be, because they've got that provision on the government books at the moment. Sorry, Daryl. We no, no, that's fine. I mean, I just felt it was really important. It's a big number, and I just want to make sure everybody appreciates the history to it. And and clearly, you know, we've got to get on with it. We know that. Um, and I'm very happy with what's being proposed, but I just felt that it was a useful explanation um, for a relatively new board. I think that um, even, even as we speak, the provision on the government's book is far larger than $750 million. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, are there any questions? Brendan. John. Uh, just, just a question to Daryl. Um, in order to rectify this, we have to have a compliant um, uh, payroll system. When do you expect that to be? Um, so in terms of um, the, the, um, the project plan here, we, um, we're hoping to be able to rectify this. Well, in terms of having a compliant uh, system, we're hoping that uh, we will have a compliant system towards the um, end of e at end of this year. Um, well, I'm actually hoping to go earlier than that. Uh, compliance in terms of the system, you'll find that actually no payroll system it's in itself is able to um, be completely compliant. Um, so there may be some processes um, that will have to happen outside the, the payroll system to actually ensure that it's compliant on a on a week by week basis. It's just the the, the fact of the um, the way the Holidays Act is written and and um, um, the difficulty that that any payroll system will have in ensuring that that uh, you know that that payroll system can actually uh, manage that uh, the, the requirements of the Act. Thank you. Brendan, can I just clarify something then? Sure, yeah. So, can I just clarify um, if roughly, you know, so 9.4 million at the moment is our provision, so that's kind of our budgeted deficit, is that right, if, if it's in our books, or is it a contra entry that there's going to be a, in 
um, you know, a deposit from government and, and a payment from, from our situation. Yeah, so, so last year we made a provision for 9.4 million in our books. So, you know, our overall deficit last year was 26, uh, oh, sorry, about 23 million, but the majority of that was actually unbudgeted holidays paid act, right? Um, this year we actually have uh, got a, um, a portion within the budget that we budgeted for where we're, we're basically increasing that provision, uh, provision as a result of that. Yeah, but we've got an incoming entry then of Kath saying that government are going to cover it, if you like. Yeah, so, so it's not confirmed yet, so we certainly haven't um, oh, allowed for the okay. revenue, if that's what you're the... Um, okay, we're is. not quite sure how they're going to do that. Um, and so that, you know, we wouldn't um, allow for that as yet. What we've done is allowed for the expense. Okay. Okay. Karen? Thank Thanks, Jenny. Karen? I'm just interested to understand if, if it's able to be explained what the nature of the non-compliance is. Is that... Or is it too complicated to explain that? Yeah. Can I, can I, sorry, can I just that? Sorry, Daryl. Um, so there are about eight or nine areas of non-compliance that the uh, memorandum, of, uh, memorandum of understanding has identified. Um, the three key ones are the calculation of or the or the meaning of the ordinary weekly pay. The uh, relevant daily pay and the average weekly earnings. Now that has a lot of components that need to be included and excluded. And the higher of these becomes the payment that uh, it becomes the entitlement to to the payment. Oh, okay. So so it is about understanding what um, allowances and what factors within the entire payroll system and across the DHB sector, different allowances are named differently across different DHBs. So to try and get an understanding of what has to be included as, as part of these calculations and what has to be excluded is, is quite a complex matter. Um, just, just going back to what John was asking earlier in terms of the timelines, and um, so Daryl's Darryl's timeline is absolutely great. Um, but it does, I just wanted to um, outline that all these timelines are guided by the Memorandum of Understanding document. Um, which has these, which has the entire project divided into three different bits, um, like Daryl's paper outlines, which is about um, uh, review, rectification, and remediation. So it's and, and they, they've got timelines associated to each one of them. Okay, I think that's yes, a good. Thanks for that explanation. Can I just ask that MOU document? Is that a public document? Which we would be. So it's been signed by all unions and all chief executives. So, yes, it, it is a public document. We'll pop okay. it up on our um, governance site for you, Karen, if you're interested in having a look. Thank you. That'd be lovely. Okay, I think that concludes the discussion um, in that space. So, we've got uh, the Holiday Compliance Act to. Uh, uh, to note the update and and note the um, the accrual number. So um, I'll move that those recommendations be noted, and we've got a seconder. Somebody wave at me. Somebody. Okay. So John, thank you. Um, moved and seconded. I put that in favour. Please say aye. Against it's carried. Aye. Just want to make an acknowledgement to the CEO who secretly asked somebody to go out of the room and go around to Selena's office and tell her to stop filing your fingernails. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Rightio. Uh, we're, we're going well for time. So um, we're now thank going you, back. Thank you. I'll be leaving the meeting now. Oh, thank you, Kaya. Thanks. Bye, Kaya. Um, see ya. We go um, back to the... Brendan, it's Judith here. I'm also leaving the meeting now, if that's okay. Thank you. Sure, Judith. Thank you. Bye, Judith. Neil, thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye Neil. Daryl. Shit, they're all bailing Bye. out. Oh, gosh, they're all bailing out. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, COVID-19 update. Um, who's running that one? I am. So, all good. Yeah. I haven't bailed. It's tempting, but I haven't. Um, <laughs> yeah, here I am. So, look, it's a pretty lengthy report. Yep. Um, Yep. So um, I and I apologise for the for the the length of it. However, I think it gives an incredibly um, good sense to board members of the comprehensive nature of the work 
that the team have been undertaking um, to prepare and also to deliver services during uh, this time. Um, uh, and, you know, to a certain extent, it's, an it's still an evolving situation um, where we're having to respond uh, each day and each week to um, new direction or, or um, I guess, um, different areas of focus might be a good way of um, describing it. So um, look, I'll take it um, as read if you were, <laughs> if you had the energy and um, yeah. concentration to get through that whole paper, um, and yeah. I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I have to say, I thought the paper was uh, brilliant. Um, it gave us a stunning uh, overview um, of the range, uh, the complexity, um, the variety, the magnitude um, of what has been uh, dealt with over the last, um, the last three weeks. Uh, so there shouldn't be any apologies uh, for the length of it. Um, there, there is, I think that uh, both Oriana and Jenny have got some questions in one space uh, and I've got a couple of questions um, in, another, in another section there. So maybe we'll pick up Ori and, and Lou as well. Uh, Karen, radio. Oh, everybody. Okay, so I'm going to kick off with um, Oriana and Jenny. You might want to just get your question through first and then we'll go Lou, Karen, Matara. Yep, you can see my question in the notes and Jenny will speak to it for me. Thank you, Jenny. Kia ora. Um, okay, so yeah, and I'll do my best to represent um, Oriane on the second part, but firstly, in the first part, oh, I also want to note it was an excellent update, Kath, and, and thank you very much for that. Um, it, was, it gave us a great insight and understanding into, like you say, the many aspects that and varied and, and across the board um, that, that everyone's been working so hard on there. So um, specifically though, um, Oriana has clearly had some um, feedback and, um, and as, as have I, and some questions around the maternity piece. That is just, so like I say, bear with me because I'm just trying to represent Oriana's feedback correctly. So just in regards to the early discharge support package. So first, Oriana is just interested in, in this as there has been feedback um, around that people are concerned that the two to four hours after delivery places pressure on both um, Fano at home and also on the midwifery workforce. Um, and she also asks who supports the mother who's presenting late and doesn't have a midwife, um, and also how this potentially, this early discharge in particular, will affect our, our breastfeeding rates. So I might, um, if Jeff, if you're happy to uh, jump in um, there, given it relates to your particular cluster. Good. Thank you, Jenny. Um, there is no doubt, I mean, I'm speaking as a paediatrician here as well, there's no doubt this is going to have an effect on the early breastfeeding. It's going to have an effect on attachment. Um, you know, th it, there is no doubt uh, that th there will be things that we wouldn't, in normal circumstances, want to, um, want to confront. But this is a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice um, to save lives. And I think, you know, going from our Prime Minister herself, she has explained it better than I can. These are not things that we would desire to do, but the safety of our entire community depends on these sorts of measures. Um, so early discharge is uh, not compulsory, but is encouraged. And it is uh, our, our plan led by Paula Spargo, our Director of Midwifery, has been to wrap as much care around those families uh, around the, birth, the mothers giving birth, around the partners who have been sent home, um, and when somebody is discharged early to home, as much community support for their LMCs and for them. Uh, I think that's all I can really say. Okay, and Jeff, my part that I added to that was just some, um, you know, concern around um, readmission of, of unwell babies that we're seeing this early discharge and some readmission of, of unwell babies. Is there, 
is that considered part of the, the sacrifice too, or is there any real concern that we're noting we need to put extra things in place for that at the moment? Uh, specifically, we have not seen an uptick in admissions uh, above what we would normally see. But in a practical sense, I can reassure you that we have actually established a pre-neonatal unit admissions room where these babies are checked out, assessed, so that we are not, uh, uh, well, we're, we're trying to break the chain of transmission if somebody comes back in from the community with a baby uh, that they have problems with. Okay. okay. So that's picked up Jenny and Oriana's point. Lou, yeah, oh, sorry. Oriana did just have one more piece, um, Brenda. Oh, sorry, sorry, Oriana. To, I think Oriana had it noted on page 112 in regards to the comments, and Kathy, you might be able to speak to this financial viability of general practice. So it talks about the higher cost structures they're experiencing. Yes moment um, and just looking into is this a good opportunity to think about what general practice may look like post COVID-19 um, in general rather than just the cost viability aspect and, and if there's any comment to that. I think both of those are true so um, there has been some additional um, payment and bring forward of payments into primary care um, facilitated by the Ministry of Health and Government to support the viability of this sector. Um, undoubtedly, um, uh, like the District Health Board though, there have been some benefits to our population around receiving care in a way that they actually quite like. So um, if you think about our virtual outpatient appointments where people haven't had to travel, Similarly, in general practice, people have enjoyed the um, virtual appointments. So I think the um, thing that the Ministry has been quite clear on and that we're also quite clear on and that Judith mentioned in her work is how do we keep the gains or the changes, the innovations that we've moved more rapidly to implement because of COVID? How do we make sure we don't go backwards and revert? So, um, I can't speak for the PHO and general practice other than I know that they are looking at this and we seem to be doing it from a DHP perspective. Thanks, Keith. And that probably segues nicely into my very last piece, thank you, as I've tried to give Oriana's feedback as well as my own. Um, yeah. I think my very last piece of feedback um, was in regards to what you've just said, Kath, about looking at how we leverage off um, all, you know, off gains in general. And I think you speak to that on, I think that's spoken to on page 120. Um, but he's just also noting as a board member and, and you know, we're representing, um, you know, we're here for the board, but we're also here for the community. And, and I think I just want to note for the community that the community has moved with these gains in a highly reactive and responsive extraordinary time to get the right things in place for everyone's safety, those sacrifices that you mentioned, our community, our workforces are making sacrifices. But I guess I just want to note that when we look at these gains at the end, we come back into our normal consultation um, that we would do during some of the significant decisions that have been made during this time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think that's yeah. a fair and reasonable point. Thank, thanks, Jenny. Um, uh, on here. Thanks, audience. So, so we had Lou, then Karen, Matara, and John. That's the sequence. So, Lou? Yeah, I've got two questions, if you don't mind. Um, one of them is goes to the COVID-19 um, responses we've been hearing on TV. The, um, the, uh, the Director General made it very clear that he'd instructed health boards to uh, make sure that the, the safety gear had been issued to all the um, aged care centres and it was going to be an audit on them. Have we done anything there yet, please? So, um, Lou, when we were provided with the first uh, set of masks, it was some 81 pallets of masks, we put in place um, a logistics Firm to distribute that to our providers. So we were really well placed and we did that within a day of those masks arriving. 
Yeah. Um, we are expecting uh, another supply which will go out. Um, we've also um, had a conversation around just following up with our um, aged care providers, noting that uh, Andrew and Saeed and the team have been in very close contact with, in particular, our aged residential care yeah. uh, facilities and our home and community support services, and they will continue to do that um, as we speak. We've had no uh, complaints as a district health board um, about uh, our own uh, process of distributing um, in particular the masks uh, to uh, those providers, but we're very open to hearing uh, of any concerns and we'll be going back out to them all again uh, as we yep. speak, just to make You've sure. You've had none at all? Okay. No. Um, in, in a situation with the um, uh, personal care that people go into the homes, in some cases, people are going to three or four homes in the same day and they have not got masks at this stage. Now, is that not a danger? They should have masks. So the masks were distributed. Um, the masks not as of today. Yeah, well, the masks are being distrib were distributed for two reasons. There are yeah. still only um, certain circumstances where um, carers would be required to use protective equipment. And then there are circumstances where it is um, provides, um, I think, a, a measure of security to the person receiving care as well as yeah. to the person providing care that people are using masks. Um, yeah. If people haven't got masks, I'd be really keen to understand what company and who and where so we can follow up because we're not aware of that. Um, yeah. uh, it was, you know, it. it there was a, um, you know, there was a sort of a, a different approach to the use of masks to enable that people to feel secure. The critical thing that we want to be auditing on really is the proper use of PPE, because actually it's not that easy just to slap on a mask and then, um, you know, not know how you correctly put that mask on, how long that mask will protect the wearer if they're yeah. coughing, because, it, you know, it's really the wearer of the masks that's maintaining their secretions as opposed to the person that's getting the care. Yeah, I agree. So, hand hygiene, you know, we don't want people to feel a false sense of security either. You know, hand hygiene still remains the most important oh, yeah. thing that those carers should be practising when they're going into... A home, but look, we, we're going to be going back out to all the providers. But if yep. you know of um, providers in here as where there's an issue, please do let us know. Oh, well, I'll get them to let you know. Um, yep, the, the concern that was brought up to me was that they were going to two or three bubbles in the same day. You know, they were going to one bubble, then into someone else's bubble, and someone else's bubble without changing, without bathing, without doing anything other than washing their hands. Is that safe? That's was the question. Well, they absolutely should be practicing significant hand hygiene. Yeah, they go, oh, they're doing that. Yeah, and that was, that was, that was um, my first question. And my second question was noticing the relationship between Burwood and, and Rose City, whatever, Rose, whatever it was, and how the patients were all transferred into Burwood Hospital. If one of our um, aged care centers here had a, a an outbreak there, are we set up to transfer large numbers of older people into the hospital or where would they go? Or what do we um, have in place for that? So uh, there's a couple of things um, there. One is um, that, that was to support the resourcing um, and yes. staffing because there were um, staff shortages um, that meant that they couldn't care for those people all in that facility. So, um, and not all of the um, residents were moved into a hospital setting. So there's a couple of answers. One, we'd have to look at the specifics of the situation and what the staffing opportunities were. Plus, we also do have an MD ward at the moment that we've got designated as a COVID ward. They're going and there. Potentially, yeah. And another thing is that we can potentially move our 
um, opal um, patients into our star centre and create another opal setting. Uh, so we've got some op options available, which we um, probably just need to crisp up a bit given the rapid expansion of COVID in, in yeah. aged residential care settings. Yeah, and that one was a particular worry because it was dementia and, and uh, those patients would be the hardest to handle at all. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Luke. Karen was next. Thank you. And my re question related to the finance section on page 119, which is good that we're tracking the COVID-19 related costs. Um, I'm just wondering, at this point, do we have any indication from the Ministry of, of whether they will be providing additional funding for us to cover this, or are we simply just identifying this so that, and, and is it expected that we meet this within our budgets? Um, there is an indication that we will receive support for some, um, probably not all, of these costs, um, but it remains a work in progress. So, um, you know, we don't have confirmation on the specifics of what funding may or may not be provided to us, Karen. Um, but, but just to add to that, um, so on Friday when we the chairs had the phone in with the minister, I specifically asked that question around yeah. the level of support, and the message is clear that we keep a very accurate record of our costs, and the message is clear that there will be some form of support. Um, the message is unclear as to whether that's a hundred percent or not. To be okay. to be fair, so. Um, uh, there is an understanding that we as DHBs simply can't pick that up in its entirety. So I think that's fair and reasonable. Uh, there'll be some expenditure that's occurred where maybe we can get additional advantage from that in the longer term, and I'll see that as an investment that maybe we should cover off on. So some of that technical stuff maybe, but yeah. So reinforcing okay. Kath's view, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Just, just while we're in that... No, we won't. No, we won't. Hold on. Uh, Matara was next. Thanks, Brendan. Um, I kind of had a couple of comments and also a few questions. Um, so firstly, thank you very much, Kath, and congratulations to the team for the incredible effort uh, that's going on in respect to all the work being carried out. Thank you very much. Um, and please pass those um, thanks on to everybody. Um, I just really wanted to um, pick up a few things. Uh, one was I, I wondered whether or not uh, what was happening, had we seen any increase in our own data around family harm? Um, I do know a bit about what's going on in, in the community. And the, although there's been an initial spike, uh, it now has settled back down to um, pre-COVID um, occurrences, which is still unsatisfactory, I might add. I'm not in any way saying that's good enough. Um, also, I wanted to, I had um, heard anecdotally um, through community that there was a greater concern in respect to um, serious suicide attempts and um, suicide completions. And I just wanted to be able to uh, see, understand if we were seeing any impact of that, given the impact of mental health at this time and well-being. Um, so that was one. Um, I just uh, thank you, Kath, for um, talking about Tahi, just to mention that. Um, my next point, I, I'm quite interested about the whole uh, childbirth um, experience, what's going on in that space, the changes to the Hortofenua maternity and about our opportunity given um, it's a pretty much a new dawn and there's definitely a number of innovations that can be maintained and maybe even though it may be difficult for um, mamas being discharged of after such a short time, it could be that on the reflection of looking at the data and collecting maybe some narrative that we find that this is a preferred solution. Uh, so, you know, there are a number of things that perhaps um, could be looked at in relation to gains innovation and data. And I did wonder 
whether or not there was opportunity to consider a post-COVID evaluation so that actually we got it framed up and sorted in a coherent mm. manner to be able to look at what those gains are, what the innovations are, and therefore what will be our next approach with some of the change that we are seeing currently. So one about mental health and suicides, one about evaluation. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that um, uh, Whakapai uh, is being supported to establish a testing site um, with a focus on all community, but obviously helps to improve access for Māori. Um, so that's, that's to be noted and congratulated for the support given to that. Um, I did have two other questions. So one about mental health, one about evaluation. The next one was about, I, I had sort of asked earlier about the numbers of staff employed by the District Health Board who are either completely off work because they have a predisposition to a long-term condition or a auto um, have an immune suppressant um, condition. Those, the numbers working from home and the numbers who are normal, taking their normal, if you like, new normal um, approach to work. And I just wondered where we got to with those numbers. And then lastly, I, uh, well, two things, sorry. One was around annual leave, um, I noticed that it's increasing, of course. I just wondered um, our approach to encouraging staff. Are we also being mindful that uh, staff will also want to maybe take time in the future and that if we encourage them to take annual leave at this time, we may create unintended consequences. So I just wanted to mark that we are, I hope, taking a supportive approach that as opposed to overly encouraging people to take leave. And then in relation to our responsibility as governors and our movement going forward and having also had some discussion with other um, appointed members across the country. It seems that, uh, you know, we have to look into the future a wee bit and look how we actually bring back some of the services that we were previously providing. We have an opportunity to examine that closely. And I would like to put forward an idea about the establishment of a subcommittee of the board to look at uh, some of this planning going forward also where there is opportunity for change to occur and a framework for evaluation. So I'd just like to table those, that as an idea and explore those other questions. Okay, okay so, Dr. Rao, so Kath, Kath, you up for this? Yep. So um, rather than uh, answer some of the questions that you've had, I'd rather wait until we've got the data available so that we can um, say, here is the data around suicides um, in a non-COVID scenario versus in a COVID scenario. So um, once that data is available, we can report to the board. So we won't have all of that data now, but we will definitely report that through to the next board uh, meeting. Um, certainly, um, we know that there is increased um, mental um, stress and pressure, but uh, to the extent that we're seeing uh, an uptick in um, completed suicides, um, you know, I, I don't want to answer that until we've got the data um, in front of us. In terms of, um, and I, I will get, I think I'll get to them all, but maybe not quite in the same order that you've raised them, um, Matiro. So the other thing around staff who are um, who've been identified as immunocompromised um, uh, staff who are over 70, etc. There's been a huge amount of work which is referred to in here. And again, that work has been continuing right through last week, for example, having all of our uh, over 70s um, referred to and reviewed by our occupational health and safety physicians. 
Um, and we've had to spend some additional money to enable that to happen. So there are people that are at work, there are people that are not at work, there are people physically and there are people who are working from home. So part of this was investing significantly in new um, Citrix licence and arrangements to enable people to work from home. And I think we've now up to a point where we've got up to about 200 in the facility for more than 200 staff to be working from home. Um, but that remains a work in progress too. Um, but we, we will have that data that we can provide in a more meaningful way to you once we just get a bit further along in this and can uh, actually do that um, look and um, count up of those things. In terms of annual leave, um, people haven't been pressured into going on annual leave, but we are aware that you know, people had been tired going into COVID. They were tired, a number of our professional groups were tired from the unrelenting demand and pressure that they've had uh, in our inpatient setting over many months. Um, once we got through the initial setup and training and all of those things, the fact that the hospital is somewhat empty does create an opportunity for people to have a break. That's what we want. We want people to be able to refresh we don't know what the future looks like. Um, it could go. It could go in any direction. You know, we could um, go out of level four and continue to, um, you know, not have any significant pressures on our hospital from COVID, or we could enter a whole different kind of unknown future where COVID does actually emerge and become more significant than we than we would want. So we've just got to be prepared for everything. And so I think um, staff being well rested. Uh, as a part of that and also staff being able to be at home with their families where they want to do that at this time. So um, I think it's a bit of a balancing, a bit of a balancing act. In terms of, but again we can provide data. So I think this whole area, area around workforce and staff, what I'm hearing from you is you'd like us to provide um, some more robust data and uh, reporting on that, which, which we will in fact do. Um, and, and make sure that you have that and we can figure out how, you know, it would be good to know when you'd like to have that and how we provide that to you if you'd like it sort of ahead of the next board meeting. In terms of the, in terms of the um, post-COVID evaluation, so Judith Catherwood is the recovery lead. So in um, the structure for government's emergency uh, framework and response, um, there is recovery leads uh, as part of your INT. Um, and so Judith has been working with her own team and with others around um, the framework that we would use around recovery, um, which will include some elements of reviewing, if not formally, formally, probably not formally evaluating, because to probably evaluate, we needed to have set that up ahead of doing what we were doing as opposed to after we've already done it. But we can certainly review what we've done and look at those um, things, uh, create, I guess, a framework to do that um, so we can best measure um, what things are valued and what things are not and how we might go forward. So, again, Judith is probably the best place to talk to that, but it remains at this time a work in progress. Um, and I'll leave it to the board to sort of have a conversation around the appropriate board uh, structure. I mean, I'm confident that um, as, a, as a team, we've got the right people doing the right thing, so we'll be able to provide a plan to the board for the board to have a nice. good sight of, to respond and input to, as well as to monitor going forward. Kath, I think in that space, and, and Mother, I think um, you know that proposition that you've put through is highly constructive. Probably my perspective would be that at a point where practical, we as a full board um, need to sit around the table in a, in a comfortable um, setting, not a formal board setting, but with the team, um, uh, with Judith and others, just to get that overall perspective around where things are at and we can all have our input um, to that and then maybe from there we can determine what model we want to use to go for I completely support um, everything you've articulated and I think there's a lot of value that can be gained uh, I just I, we just need to work out what the timing is it really has got to be face to face so in summary a post 
COVID evaluation crucial? How do we take advantage of it to its fullest? And we need the full board to get their heads around that. And then what values can we add by governance, uh, participation with management to enact some of those um, opportunities that I think you are clearly observing. So um, can we, I've got, I've taken all the notes here. Um, yep. I'm sure you've got them as well, Kath. And out of that, we can get something really constructive, I think. Yeah, thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Kath. Uh, I guess that I'm just, um, you know, it, such a lot is changing. Yeah. And yeah. I consider that the circumstances are creating yeah. a perfect storm, to use your yeah. term, Brendan. Yep. Yeah. Yep. for yep. immense change to occur and especially yep. on the front of improving Māori health outcomes yep. and yep. the ability yep. to actually turn the Titanic which we haven't been able to do previously so uh, I'm heartened by your um, summary Brendan yep. and I'm also though pressing upon us the importance of being um, mindful of the time frame and yep. being expedient in the way that we undertake this so yeah Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you and appreciate that, uh, Matara. Um, John, Muriel and Vaughan are the three that I've got next. And I know that some of you are going off for a cup of tea. Please do that. I've, I'm pretty keen to not stop for obvious reasons. So, John, is John there? Yeah, yeah Brendan, I'm here. Where is, where is Dry it? finger again. Look, look two things. Uh, first of all, uh, to, to Kat, uh, Kat, look, the recovery section was, was, I found, really compelling. But before I go into that, going back to page 112 and the, fi the, viability, the, the financial viability of uh, general practice and community pharmacy. Now, these are um, outside agencies that we have a direct contractual relationship with. There are others as well. My concern also goes to the broader sector, and particularly those who uh, have responsibilities under the Health Practices Competency Act. And that there are other providers that feed into the sector that are, are, are suffering the same uh, financial impact. There's a, basically, they can't see their patients. Um, so this goes um, to Allied Health, um, but also um, Crest Hospital and Broadway Radiology. Now, we, we, we're to a degree reliant on them, you know, to keep the sector as a whole. And um, I think the our, our district was looking to the DHB for some leadership on this. Now, we've covered this fairly well in terms of general practice and community pharmacy. How can we provide some leadership to these other health providers as well who are struggling? Um, so, the Crest question has been dealt with, all of these matters have been dealt with nationally through the Ministry of Health and through the Government and Treasury. So. Um, we have uh, worked with uh, Crest and provided to, as requested by the Ministry of Health, a letter outlining the impact to Crest financially on their business. And then I understand that Cabinet was considering that matter, uh, not the Crest matter, but the general matter of private hospital um, viability. Um, we haven't picked up, it would be fair to say that um, this has been pretty fast moving and not every provider has been picked up um, and there are different kinds of providers, some who are solely um, responsible for um, delivering, um, you know, using public funding and co-payments in general practice. I guess there's also the role of ACC as the most significant funder of private hospital and private imaging services. Um, so some of these measures are outside of a DHB remit. Um, but the second part is on the recovery and um, are we going to be, um, it's just really a technical question in terms of our further community testing. Are we going to, um, are there some strategic uh, approaches being made like uh, testing like workers going into aged care and things like that? So again, um, we are dependent on the government's advice. And as of last week, the advice around what was proposed for uh, aged residential care testing may in fact change, depending on where the ministry uh, sits on, on this matter. And I imagine they're looking at that. I, in fact, heard the Prime Minister say she's 
seeking independent advice on that matter um, as of today. So again, with things sort of changing quite rapidly, um, you know, we're reliant on um, the technical advisory group that's been set up to advise government and their decisions on those things. Thank you. Thanks, John. Muriel? Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Am I, can you hear me? Shoot. Yep. yep. Um, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Kath, for a very um, comprehensive and informative report. And um, I'd just like to take the opportunity to particularly support the discussion around um, our opportunities for um, leveraging on the um, positive outcomes and how we might um, um, do that moving forward. I've got a couple of, um, or several, just um, small questions, really more practical ones. Um, I note the comment around um, vaccination of staff at PACE, and I was just interested to know how we might be going on that. I mean, you might not have the exact details, but I'd be interested in that. My second one is more around staff, and there were a number of comments in the report about um, welfare support and some of the practical things that are being done. But I was wondering more about um, sort of the pastoral care and from a day-to-day -day perspective, staff who are concerned and worried and have a whole lot of complex issues going on, not only at work but at home, what are some of those things that we might be doing sort of practically from day-to-day -day in the workplace? And my last question is more around, it is around recovery, but it is the practical perspective. And I, I received um, a rescheduled outpatient appointment today for myself for next week, which made me start to think that maybe we are starting to plan how we might get some of the more lower risk um, things back on track. So I was just interested in that perspective as well. Um, okay, so several things. I might just ask Selena if you've got the latest update in terms of where we sit in terms of flu vaccination numbers. Uh, I haven't got the actual figures in front of me, but I do know that they are vastly improved on previous years. So again, once we top those up, we'll get back to you. The queues have been pretty mammoth. Um, yeah. I hope that our hand, hand hygiene uh, might have improved somewhat as well, Muriel, not just <laughs> flu vaccination. Um, psychosocial, there's been a huge effort going on here to support staff, and we've got Gabs on the line who's been very active in that space as well. So, Gabs, I might ask if you might talk to that. From the psychosocial component, um, we've had a good program running for some time uh, in our connections with our district councils. Uh, I know social work have been leading a lot of work uh, along with psychology for staff uh, resources. Uh, they are sitting ready to go on the microsite at the moment. They're sitting in the iDrive. Um, we've been well placed with the support that we've had uh, developed frameworks within the organisation. So, uh, but you're right, there are, there's a lot of anxiety, particularly in the workforce. And I, and I think um, staff have, uh, we've seen that in, in different ways. Um, but Tracy's down there. You could probably, Tracy, from a, a little bit more from your workforce, uh, from your psychosocial and packages of care, um, be interesting for the board to hear that. Sure. Um, thank you, Gabrielle. Um, so there's quite a bit of work going on for the staff specifically, uh, both at an organisational level and individually. Um, at an organisational level, what we did was kicked off in the first week uh, an opportunity for any staff member to feed back to, um, uh, to a team behind the scenes any issues that they have, whether they be at a, uh, a system level or for themselves individually. Um, and we've had uh, 43 responses back through that we've been able to quickly respond to as an executive team. And we've made it really clear to the staff that we haven't got um, uh, staff on white horses behind the scenes getting all these answers for them, but actually it's a whole of an executive approach so that it doesn't take away the manner of the staff, or at least the leaders of the organisation and what they're able to provide. Um, there have been things like putting hand sanitizer bottles in specific places 
and having a more extended um, cleaning regime within the organisation, all the way through to issues around uh, physical distancing issues and the shifting of uh, services within the organisation to better support um, the current environment. So, um, you know, I take my hat off to the executive team who have been doing some really great work behind the scenes on that aspect to uh, support staff in the way they feel around being more comfortable and more safe. And I can report back to say just on my walk arounds that staff are feeling uh, the culture of the organisation is, is one that uh, people are feeling like they can actually come to, work, to us with any issues. Good know that they can either have them resolved or be uh, told that have the discussion around why it can't be resolved or can be resolved in another way. Um, we've also just recently did a bit of exercise through HR um, where we identified where staff actually live, those who are still working. And what we've done is we've put that information back out to the clusters so that they can do welfare check-ins with people who live a further distance away from the organisation and might have been carpooling before COVID-19. And that way they can check in on people just to see how they are financially and uh, maybe what's going on for them on an individual basis. Also, the spiritual care team have kicked in beautifully. Um, of course, they were always there, uh, but what they're doing now is they've got a set regime about how they walk around the organisation and just check in on people uh, and make sure specifically that they're supporting managers on how they do these welfare check-ins with their staff because, you know, clearly some people are better at it than others. So we want to make sure that managers are supported to be able to do those welfare check-ins. And then um, we've had a conversation with the psychologists up at Mass University just to say, um, can we put you on tap? We need you. Um, have um, staff, if there's specifically some high-level issues that could be worked through, that we've um, got them on tap for them to go. Brilliant. And, well done, um, Tracy. And there's some quite practical things that staff feel anxious about, they, which we've provided lots of support and guidance on. It might be, is it safe to you know, wear my uniform home, how do I wash my uniform? It might be about, will you provide accommodation to me outside of my home bubble if I'm caring for COVID patients? And we've got some really good pieces of work that have been developed and great accommodation options that we've worked through. Um, so there's, you know, it's sort of so much that we've been doing in this space. Uh, and I'd have to say as an executive, the level of support for each other has been quite phenomenal and um, it will be Judith's fault that we all have to join Jenny Craig at the end of this <laughs> because we've been, been eating her home baking, uh, which turns out to be very tasty. Thank you for that, Kath. That's very informative information. <laughs> Um, now, Vaughan, are you able to... Uh, hold on, sorry. Um, just oh. a bit about recovery, Kath. Did you have any comment to make on that? Sorry, sorry. In terms of the fact that I'd got an appointment and I just was interested in what the sort of recovery plan around outpatients and so on is. Yes, you're 100% right. So when it became clear that um, we, we don't have uh, significant amounts of COVID in our community, in fact, we know exactly who in our community does have COVID, where they are, and they are all related to known clusters or travel. Um, and, you know, we've got less than 1% of our tests that return as positive, which is good. Um, so, um, and as it becomes clearer that the numbers remain low and static, so we haven't touched wood, had a, a new COVID case now for a week, which is great in our community. Um, we, it gave us the opportunity to turn our minds to ensuring that we don't dilly-dally in terms of thinking about the hospital being able to return to a different level in a staged and planned way, um, including um, moving from orange to yellow uh, concurrently, although not dependent on the government, potentially moving to a level three out of a level four. So um, we are starting to... Um, think about planned care in particular and how we can um, start to grow planned care working with Crest also. Uh, it's a fine balance, Muriel, about who, who we want to ensure that we're seeing and who we don't. Thank you very much for those responses. It's very helpful. Brilliant. Thank you, Keith. Um, so, Vaughan, are you able to communicate now? Do you know? Yeah, I believe so. Can you hear me now? Perfect. 
Great. It works. I changed the devices, so uh, I'm not sure what happened earlier. Thank you. Um, similar question around the recovery and understanding when we're looking at our confirmed and probable cases against other DHBs that was publicised um, last week that we're sitting at the table. Is there any conversations that you have been around the recovery back out where the CETA take up other services and that will be different or will there continue to be a national-wide approach? Is that known yet? Um, so we don't know. Um, I think you dropped out a little bit. I think I've got you. So, um, so there are different levels of testing in different districts and we have gone back to the Ministry to ask about the publication of testing rates in our region because it seems somewhat lower, about 20% lower than we have recorded. So we've checked up on that. In saying that, the government has been um, indicating that potentially there might be some surveillance testing. We don't know whether or what that might look like yet, Paul, and so that will be dependent on the Ministry of Health determining um, that approach going forward. At the same time, we have had a conversation this morning, um, and Matiro picked up on some of the conversations we've been having about ensuring that um, we perhaps don't have the drop-off, as much of a drop-off in our testing as we've been experiencing across the course of the weekends and that we're actually making sure that we're reaching vulnerable um, individuals and communities who are experiencing um, symptoms that would be consistent with the case definition. So there's still a bit of work for us, even without going to surveillance, to make sure that we're confident around who we're reaching and we're also getting some analytics that are going to give, give that to us as well. So, you know, we've got a team looking at that now just to kind of get a bit of a sense of where things are coming from. Um, we do uh, want to ensure that we are reaching, uh, in particular Māori, who would be significantly impacted if COVID were, were to um, occur in their, their families, their whanau, their communities, and there are other um, communities that we're concerned about as well. I'm happy with that. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks, Kath. Brilliant. Th thanks, Vaughan, and, and thank you, Kath. Now, I think everybody's had um, had a go at this COVID report. Um, can I just just wash it out, Kath? If you go to um, finance number eight, finance. Um, if you uh, just for accuracy and and, and for clarity. If I add up the numbers that are shown in that section, it's near enough to three and a half million dollars in total. Uh, would I don't know if you if you got your head around that, but we got we got 0.98 million and 1.98 million and about a half a million. If I add them all together, it's about three and a half. Is is that how you understand it? Um, there are different there are different numbers and definitions as well. So some of that is capital spending, yeah, and yeah, some yeah. Of, and some of it's operating spending, and different numbers flow through at different times. Um, and I get a report myself, uh, kind of either on a daily or or maybe slightly less regular basis. Um, and I just looking at the most recent one that I had. Um, it was 3.2 million on Thursday. Um, so on Thursday we okay. had um, about 753 op-eds, about close to one and a half on IT, close yeah. to half a million in the clinical space and close to half a million in the, in the facility space. But we are still, as we speak, spending yeah. money on yeah. some of our facilities. Okay. And I'm... I'm not, I'm not reluctant to keep doing that. So, for example, some of the work we're doing in the ICU in the ward environments around airflow, um, I think it's prudent. You know, whilst we think we might have um, avoided, dodged a bullet at this stage, who knows what the future might yeah. look like. We, this is such an unknown, um, yeah. you know, illness that, you know, for all we know, you know, it, it you know, finds other ways to kind of yeah. suddenly get out and expand in our community. So we just want to make sure, come what may, for months, we, we've got a hospital that's ready. So I suppose really what I was highlighting is that, as I read it, it's near enough to about 3.5 million so far, 
which is on that COVID um, number that we're recording costs. And then from there, I just want so everybody gets their head around it. Um, uh, and then we'll have our discussion with the ministry around what portion of that gets covered off. Yeah, and just bearing in mind though that, that um, those costs won't pick up things like lost revenue. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, got that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 got that. Right, so the last point, the last observation I want to make, which I think is crucial and really, really important, uh, on the last page, on page 120, uh, uh, the, the, the heading compassionate leadership and team culture, leadership uh, development. If you read those two, uh, those two sections. Uh, what a wonderful, wonderful message around when it really comes to the crunch, the team get up and perform. And so the relationship building that's occurred there, uh, the, 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 um, the leadership that's been shown and the, and, the, and the desire for people to come together, I think is superb. So it's a wonderful reflection, not just on management, it's on the whole organisation uh, right the way through. And I think it's you know, as chair, I just want to make that acknowledgement. Um, I know that this report was long, uh, and I know that Kelly put a hell of a lot of effort into getting it ready, uh, but I think um, superb. So well done. And on that note, I'll move that the report be noted and uh, seconded by uh, Heather. Yeah. I'll put that in favour. Please say aye against Carrie. Right, Bye. now that computer has failed me up here. Please don't do that now. We've done the Holidays Act. Um, we're, I think we're on to HDAC previous minutes, which I'd be keen to move receipt of with a seconder. Seconded, uh, Jenny, thank you. Is there any discussion on those minutes? No. Move then to, uh, so I'll put that in favour, please say aye against Kerry. Moving aye. to the FRAC previous minutes. Um, prepared to move receipt of those in a seconder. Lou seconds. Was that right, Lou? Thank you. Um, any discussion on the FRAC minutes? No. So I'll move that uh, in favour, please say aye against aye. Carrie. Aye. So we go to the Mana Whenua Haora uh, report. Oriani, what's the Magni comment? Is Oriana there? Has anyone got any questions? Uh, Tracy may speak, may speak to this, but no, I haven't got any comment in particular. I've written okay. a couple of things, just in yeah. case I freeze. But no, I don't have any comment. Okay, Tracy, is there anything more to add? Uh, no, I think the report looks pretty explicit to me. Yep, yep, yep. Are there any think, quick yes. questions? Brendan, Sorry. I just think, um, so Not Oriana totally. has put up about the um, Iwi Chairs meeting. So I think, um, you know, for people to be aware that uh, Mike Smith, um, who is... Um, at that table and along with other iwi leaders they are being engaged in a way that hasn't occurred before directly with the prime minister and facilitated by um, uh, the crown iwi relationship yeah uh, lil anderson who is heading that up yeah and i think that we are going to see significant change in the way that some of the resourcing uh, comes to iwi and maori and also some of the considerations that are needing to be undertaken. And I guess that also what I see in the Mana Whenua Haora, um report, notes, meeting, yeah. is explicit components that somehow we have to make sure we bring across to every board meeting to ensure that we are aligning ourselves with the advice and also the expectation of the iwi leaders who are at mana whenua table so i think we need to somehow do that uh, in a way that is transparent and visible to every board mention okay um any other comments no 
Rightio. So um, I'm just trying to just bear with me, guys. I thought I had a note on this, but oh, I know what it was. So um, there's two or three people that have um, needed to resign. Sounds like a terrible word, doesn't it? But they have. They've got, but it's a constructive resignation. They've gone off uh, to better things. How how um, how are those replacements going? Oh, kia ora, Brendan. Uh, the COVID-19 situation has put all yeah. that on hold. Uh, we right. did have a mana whenua hauora meeting, and that really was just to to give Tracy an opportunity to update uh, our members last week. But um, okay. that piece of work will be on hold till we um, are post-COVID-19. Okay, that's fine. I appreciate that. Okay, um, so we've got the report there to uh, to to note. And um, uh, Matara, are you prepared to move that? Yes, I am. Thank you. And uh, we've got a second. And Norman, you happy to second it? Thank you. Put that in favour, please say aye. Against, it's carried. Now, we've just aye. got the board's aye. work programme now, which is generally for noting. Um, um, is there any questions of the work program? Just let me have a look. Nobody, nobody's waving anywhere. I am. Somebody is somewhere. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Karen. That's what okay. I was just going to ask for some clarification. Um, obviously, with suspending our committees. Um, um, and apologies if it is in here somewhere, I just couldn't see it. Um, what's the intention in terms of when HDAC and FRAC will start up again? And are we expecting that the work and those that have been identified in those committees will just all come to the board? Or will, that, or will some of the work wait until those committees recommence? Um, good question. So I think to be fair, we're taking it week by week and we all understand why um in an ideal world the next round we would have our separate meetings but if the uh, levels don't allow that then we're going to keep everything into the one group so that we're all all involved and nobody um uh, nobody misses out on uh, on engagement is that I can't answer it any better than that, I don't think so, at the moment, Karen. Perhaps just to be more specific in terms of the short term, the HDAC meeting that was scheduled for the 28th of April, that one, is that one not happening? Is that correct? Or is it yet correct. to be decided? C correct, that won't happen. Yeah. Correct. For, and I, I, and I'm, I'm sure everybody's comfortable and understands that. I just yeah. wasn't. I didn't have a cancellation come to me about that one. So oh no, I no, 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 no. To be fair, we haven't got that far yet. So, um, but we'll get it noted. So there will be a formal notice to say that we will not have a formal frac meeting um, later this month. Well, I think we've got room to be able to move that out. Let's wait for the announcement on the whenever it is next week. Give us a sense around where we are, but um, I just, just, I'm just trying to see anybody nodding of heads. People are generally comfortable with where we're. Yeah, there's a general nodding of heads, so um, I'm comfortable with where we're sitting there. No, Brendan, it's John here. Oh, oh, can I just, can I just follow up, just briefly? So, just to be clear, if that is cancelled, are we talking that it's six weeks before we meet, like the 26th of May being our next intended meeting? I think, Karen, um, technically that would be correct, but in okay. reality, we may well want to change that depending yeah. on what on what's occurring. Is okay. that fair? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, technically correct, but let we are, you know, we're we're winging. It's the wrong word, but we're just working within the parameters at the moment. And if we need to bring that forward, then obviously we will. Okay, John. Yeah. Thank you, Brendan. Um, it's just one one piece of work that's due for completion by the the HDAC meeting, which is likely to be postponed. I um, mean, that's the Māori Health Equity Dashboard, um, because that was also um, going to be ready for mana whenua or hau order. Um, could, uh, Kath, could you please up, update us? Is that timeline still um, current, or are we is, is, is that being delayed because of the COVID-19 situation? 
I can do that for you, Kat, if you like. Um, so, the, so the work is progressing um, and we can put it out by email once we have that completed draft, if that's what you want to do, John. Um, you'll note, in, well, at least I'm noting in Oriana's report, um, that the uh, mana whenua haora don't want the word equity in that dashboard. They want it to be specific to Māori health, if that's okay. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, thanks for the clarity, Tracy. Um, Jenny? Yep, and my point was just, but I think that um, either uh, Neil, I think, alluded to it and maybe answered this question, but is it, am I correct to assume that some of the, um, when Neil mentioned, I think maybe Daryl's team and, and things like the Holidays Act, um, you know, project, that there's some key projects still being worked on, um, are things like Spire, the business case, obviously we've got some discussion on that later, um, and the mental health, um, you know, building yep. and planning yep. part of the continued prioritised projects that are continuing behind the scenes. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Absolutely Excellent. correct. Excellent. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, bear with me, guys. So we're working through the work program. We've had a number of questions on it. Do I get the sense that everybody's asked all the questions that they feel that they need to ask and have got points of clarity? general nodding of heads, which would suggest then that we can move the, to the resolution um, to, God, that the revised work program due to COVID be approved and that progress against the board work program be noted. So I'll, I'll move that, look for a second, uh, somebody who hasn't had a chance to second yet might be useful. Um, Vaughan, Vaughan. <laughs> Seconds the resolution. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so I'll put that in favour. Please say aye. Against. Aye. That's carry. Um, we've got the register of interest. We've got the glossary of acronyms. That concludes the formal board meeting as I see it for part one. So, now, so Brendan, um, not wanting to lengthen this out, but I think it's probably fair and reasonable to expect that even the next board meeting may still be a Zoom meeting, given, I think, yes. given the likelihood that Level 3 restrictions may continue for, I think that, you're right. for another yeah. four-week period after the end of April, yeah. given should we go to Level 3, I mean, that's still a debate that's being had as well. So, um, yeah, so I suspect that we'll have the next board meeting on the 26th of May as a Zoom meeting. I think that's reasonable to plan for that for the moment, yes. Okay, now somebody technically guide me. What do we do now? We need to log off, finish this part of the meeting. I suggest we give people, you know, a few minutes to maybe have a break, go to the bathroom or do whatever, and then we're going to log on to part two. Okay, well, let's take a break and, re and re reconvene at uh, so 11.40. 11.40. And it's a separate meeting with a separate ID and a separate password. 11.40. Thanks, everybody. Formally declare the meeting closed. Oh, and before we do that, just before we do that, can I provide an award to Lou for the technically most impressive background? <laughs> <laughs> Don't know how the hell you do it, but well done. Okay, see you at 11. Thanks, my dog. <laughs>